I'm Sarah Meyer. I'm a health sciences librarian at the University of Florida. Thank you for joining us for this paper presentation. Um, pleased to announce our second paper presentation today in Building 2. And this is developing a replicatable worksheet of academic uh, medical library users. And this will be presented by Fred Lapola. Thank you. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Fred Lapola, uh, also presenting, uh, not Presenting with me, but co-authoring this uh, is my colleague, Dr. Elisa Circus, and today we're going to talk about a replicability, re, re, replicability workshop uh, that we generated for our general community. So just to give a kind of quick agenda and overview, start out with some background, just sort of to uh, level out what we are talking about uh, in terms of terms when we're talking about uh, rigor and reproducibility, uh, the problem, our background experience, and then it kind of a case presentation of the workshop we created before talking about some of the lessons learned in this experience. Just to kind of be make sure that we're all relatively on the same page, I'm sure many of you are aware there are kind of a lot of different uh, jargon, a lot of different terms that are used to describe issues around replicability, reproducibility, repeatability. So we kind of take an expansive approach towards this. So building off of a 2019 report from uh, the NSF uh, called Reproducibility and Replicability in Science, they really divide in their publication into two main areas, what they refer to as computational reproducibility and experimental replicability. And I'll definitely admit, I personally tend to, even though in you know I'd like to really stick with one usage and be very consistent in my speech, that just is not how I tend to actually speak. But within our usage, when we're talking about the kind of the computational side, we're really talking about having those workflows, having those tools available. So if we begin with the same set of data and we intend to perform the same analysis, we'll get either the same or consistent results, depending on what, what types of analysis we're undertaking. Uh, conversely, when we're talking more on the experimental side, we're really talking about if you were to could, conduct a study using the same protocol, same methods, but collecting new data, uh, we would expect consistent results, but kind of in a different way than if we were running the same types of analysis on the same uh, set of data. So really both of these are sort of included in our usage of these terms, reproducibility, replicability. Um, and I just sort of want to be on the same page with that as we jump into the talk. Uh, some additional background. So in 2016, the NIH started requiring recipients of training grants to uh, receive and provide to their uh, trainees uh, rigor and reproducibility training. And they kind of broadly define this with regards to their research grant application process as addressing scientific premise. So kind of speaking to what is the background, what, you know, what previous research has been done before, why is this worth doing additional research? The rigor of the reproduced, or excuse me, the rigor of the proposed research. Uh, so, talking about kind of, are you accounting for many of the things that fall under these issues of experimental replicability? Are you using a, you know, for example, a blinded uh, model? Uh, are you blinding your subjects, for example? Uh, biological variables. So, accounting for things like if uh, there's reason or if there's no reason to believe that you should only be studying one one for example biological sex including both biological sexes in your study as opposed to more of a convenience sample as an example of a biological variable and then authentication so that you have a plan in place and you're addressing how you're authenticating that your uh, key variables so that could be things like reagents that could be things like cell lines are what they are or what they you know purport to be so as I'm sure many of you are aware, and there's been a discussion for a while, and I mean, this is not uh, a, you know, you're, you're here at a reproducibility conference, so I don't need to belabor the point too much, but there's definitely a sense that there's a crisis in uh, reproducibility of science, that when studies are being examined, there seem to be issues around how effectively those find the findings of studies can be replicated. And this is also sort of bled over into kind of the public sphere. So uh, newspapers, magazines that might not primarily be focused on uh, scientific disputes, really aware that this reproducibility crisis exists and may be an issue. Uh, and this is even sort of compounded. Uh, so the National Academy of Sciences uh, notes 
that because there's different criteria and different types of reproducibility, it can be really hard to kind of parse out even what's being sort of what's meant by the idea of a reproducibility uh, study and to what degree it may or may not ex uh, exist because of all these different standards. So within the context of our academic medical center at NYU Langone Health, uh, for a few years now, since 2016, uh, a team of librarians uh, consisting of myself and my colleague, Dr. Lisa Serkis, uh, and previously my colleague, or my former colleague, uh, uh, Kevin Reed, uh, who, who moved to, who went to a different institution, we've taught a credit-bearing class for our PhD biomedical sciences program. So kind of a wide-ranging program, uh, ranging from cell biology to uh, uh, computational work, uh, so a lot of a lot of range in that program, and we've provided uh, training on rigor and reproducibility in that context. But we have not, in our institution, had or provided opportunities for the general faculty or staff. So both the library and the general institution at large has not offered this to the uh, whole community. So seeing that gap we felt that it might make sense to provide that training. Uh, we felt that it would be appropriate for us. As I mentioned, since 2016, we've offered this class. And we really, it previously it mentioned and touched upon, it was kind of a general skills class, and it featured training on rigor and reproducibility. But in the past two years, we really overhauled it to be very focused exclusively on rigor and reproducibility. So that's a one credit class uh, for about eight or so sessions and a, and a final exam. So we felt confident that we could teach this material and that we felt comfortable discussing topics relating to rigor and reproducibility and that it would be appropriate, especially given the library's kind of positioning as an educational hub within our institution. So we developed what we've called the rigor and reproducibility workshop. And this is a uh, 90 to two minute, two, two minute, 90 minute to two hour uh, introductory session. Uh, and it's really intended to provide a high level overview of topics relating both to computational reproducibility and to experimental replicability. So we've touched upon issues of power and P values, blinding and randomization, sex is a biological variable, authentication of key variables, publication bias, transparent and transparency. So really as much as possible, we tried to frame things around those NIH standards of what they consider to be core issues of rigor and reproducibility. And I think grounding it kind of in that NIH requirement has both helped us develop our materials as well as connect to the actual needs of our uh, research community. Because again, it is a primarily, it is a, an academic medical center. So that NIH sta uh, stamp of approval, as it were, goes a long way. Uh, so the first time we offered it as a workshop was before the pandemic, and so we did offer this workshop in person, but all subsequent times have been done uh, through Zoom, so as sort of, uh, or, or WebEx, but through uh, webinar format. Uh, but in all of these cases, we've used Mentimeter, which is a sort of a question and answer type tool where users can respond digitally. In certain cases, uh, particularly if we've had students who maybe are uh, a little bit more quiet or don't necessarily feel as comfortable speaking out, being able to kind of answer questions anonymously through either their phone or computer has, in our experience, helped to sort of encourage uh, either discussion in the form of free text responses or just sort of uh, reinforcing uh, lessons by sort of immediately in sort of a formative way assessing, did this, you know, did this message stick? Do they, can they answer correctly a, a simple question based on the, the material we just taught? Uh, so as much as possible, we really do try to draw out our participants' experiences. Um, and really, I think from sort of a philosophical standpoint, uh, this really, I think, comes from this, uh, our, our attitude that there's a, a kind of a tension in the universe of rigor and reproducibility between both kind of the, like, you should do this and like kind of the best practices as they may exist, as well as kind of what the actual constraints are on researchers. And again, we are a... Uh, librarian team. Uh, we have some background, my colleague has much more background in uh, research, but really I think it's great to be able to kind of draw out those tensions as the uh, participants themselves see them and as they feel comfortable. Uh, and it both helps to kind of provide a better experience and allows to provide a more 
a comfortable environment where people can think about these topics without sort of feeling like they're being spoken at, uh, while at the same time really kind of uncovering for the room different issues that uh, different classmates may be experiencing or have experienced in the past. Uh, so we've also tailored these as much as possible to uh, the context of NYU Langone. So we talk about our scientific course of so support offices for research, as well as a biostatistical resource that is available. Uh, so we've held four sessions to date. Uh, we've held a, uh, a general medical center, uh, a general workshop for the general uh, community where we advertised it broadly and invited people. That was the in-person. Also taught to a group of dentistry postdocs, and that was an invited talk through our dental dentistry school. Uh, we've spoken to undergrads, so primarily in an internship context that they are were here doing a summer internship. Uh, so not medical school undergrads, but true like in college undergrads and or in university undergrads, and then uh, as well as clinicians uh, in a cert research certificate program. So these three last ones were all invited talks, whereas the uh, General workshop, again, was something that we posted on our internal server and to our listserv and tried to drum up attention to. So our marketed workshop that we held in person, pretty low attendance. We had five people attend and unfortunately four of those filled out the evaluation form, which is done uh, as a survey. So we had people kind of from all over, a project manager, a data analyst, a basic scientist, a researcher, and a, a dental postdoc. Uh, but those who did fill it out really did positively review the um, the material. They, and when asked if they would use the material in their work, the majority said they definitely will or probably will. Um, people were all said they would either recommend or highly recommend, but kind of split. And definitely from the standpoint of our own sort of reflective practice, it was a positive experience and people brought very interesting insights. Uh, we also discovered that people were really interested in some of those resources that were available. So things like I mentioned before, like the biostatistics resource for our researchers, as well as generally available sites like protocols.io, which is a repository of uh, study methodologies and protocols. Uh, the participants also expressed enjoying from hearing from the other researchers about their challenges. Uh, and for when we asked about what future topics might they be interested in, more focus on statistical tools and methods was came up and is a kind of a common refrain in the context of our medical center. Uh, with regards to the invited talks, they each had about between 10 and 20 participants, uh, all conducted remotely. So we did not have the same ability to perform evaluations and uh, message, uh, send, send emails to these groups, but we were able to get feedback from the faculty who organized them. And in all cases, it was overwhelmingly positive. And when it came to our own uh, reflective practice kind of as instructors, thinking about did these work, did these not work? We found that especially with the case of the student populations where maybe exposure or comfort with some of these more statistical uh, topics is is less, uh, you know, less felt. Uh, being able to talk, of, talk at kind of a general level, but also introduce them to some of these issues. For example, the problems around talking about issues like significance or the issues with underpowered studies really uh, was an interesting uh, practice or an interesting session. Uh, but at the same time, especially with the undergrads, there was less exposure to working in a lab and less of an awareness of, you know, had they tried out conducting or reproducing a, a study before. So most in that group had not. Uh, also, because our background as instructors was primarily in working with the uh, the basic science PhD program, our materials had less of kind of the clinical focus. And that's really something that was kind of on us to sort of consider uh, building up in the future. So just to sort of pivot to some of the results and lessons learned, definitely finding the appropriate setting for this workshop was, an, was and is an ongoing process. Uh, we did have better success uh, when it was uh, when we've in the past hosted workshops for our community, we found that providing a kind of concrete skill. So, for example, a training in REDCap, a training in R uh, and R Studio for statistical programming has tended to be more uh, popular and attract more interest than sort of general educational materials. So something like this where it's more of a kind of ongoing discussion and you don't really walk away with a clear answer. Uh, we found that kind of a more invited workshop in, a, in an educational, formal educational setting 
worked a bit uh, better for our group. We also felt that the library served as a good hub in this context. So uh, we have a history of providing uh, education to our community. Uh, and so this allowed us, because of different connections that have sort of been formed through the years by providing education, it allowed us to pivot and sort of be in contact with those educational programs that were looking for some degree of training and some degree of uh, education around uh, rigor and reproducibility. Uh, also, I think that our background in terms of sort of translating the kind of complex or topics that maybe are separate from the day-to-day -day milieu of, um, of researchers uh, really helped us to sort of explain the concepts of re rigor and reproducibility in, in basic terms that I think really helped, especially in the uh, environment where a lot of people feel uncomfortable with uh, statistically oriented language. And as much as possible, we found that incorporating the active learning really helped to foster the discussion. So I mentioned that Mentimeter tool for providing question and answers, both helped to kind of draw out insights from people, from participants and students who may have been quieter, uh, while at the same time um, uh, helping us to also provide a, uh, a setting for confirming that the students understood the lessons that had been taught. So just to conclude, uh, we found that adapting this to a, adapting our rigor and reproducibility education to the general community really uh, provided an opportunity to uh, work with and learn about our research community, as well as inform them about some of the tools that they have available within our context to help them in their research lives. Um, it definitely was and remains a challenge to figure out where, what is the best kind of setting for this, as we saw when we tried to just market it generally. Uh, there were many fewer people, and I think it is asking a lot to have people take time out of their day when maybe the kind of outcome is less clear. Uh, and so we found it to be very, a little bit more appropriate in kind of a standalone uh, class within a, an educational context, as opposed to something that's sort of, you know, pitched out as a come to the library and learn about this topic. Uh, so that said, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, yes, thank you so much, Fred. That was fascinating. That was a great presentation. We really appreciated learning about that. And I think you made some wonderful points, great terms for us. Um, and so we'll be starting our next presentation here in just one minute. And thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you.